and, and I'm grateful for the grind most of all I think uh, <laughs> grateful for the grind I'm grateful for the grind because yeah I love it like like you're saying like the tenant kind of moved out and um and maybe screwed you over a bit but how much did you learn about uh the human condition and about mm-hmm. about people and uh and that kind of thing welcome to the on fire podcast episode 10 with your hosts matt and kellen on fire is a weekly podcast where we discuss financial independence life hacking frugality minimalism and living within your means reviews i mean we we've gone past the point of dignity with me always pleading at this point so i'll aim for bribery instead this time so once we get to a thousand reviews kellen will post nudes i i i, I didn't agree to this in in today's episode, we interviewed Paul Plumstead. Paul is the master of multiple income streams. While holding a full-time job, he manages his four properties, he does construction and contracting work on the side, and he recently acquired his real estate license. I love Paul's approach to balance. I constantly struggle with moderation, so talking with Paul is always, it just really helps me refocus and rebalance. I can never hear enough reminders about the power of having multiple income streams. So, let's just jump into Welcome the Welcome to the podcast, Paul. Hey, happy to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you here, Paul. And so it's been a while since we last chatted, so we thought we'd just dive in. Uh, Kind of summarize for us, what's the last month look like for you? Uh, Well, that's probably why we haven't been chatting so much. I've been pretty busy, kind of just focusing in on certain areas. Um, As you guys know, I purchased a side-by-side property, and I'm renovating it, turning it into um, adding a couple of units, and also turning it into hopefully Airbnb within the next couple months. So um, focusing on that project quite a bit. And then working the full time day job and uh, uh, transitioning into got my realtor license the last little mm-hmm. while, so kind of transitioning into that. And uh, yeah, been been pretty busy with stuff, but uh, stuff has been going forward. A couple of little uh, issues, but nothing nothing too crazy. That's a lot of things all at once. So that's uh, yeah. <laughs> that's a yeah. common theme, I think. Lots <laughs> lots on the go, like you guys, right? Yeah. So uh, we know that you're a big fan of having multiple streams of income. What do some of your income streams look like right now? Uh, right now, it's mainly I work in billing services at the London Catholic School Board. So I've been there for about four to five years. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of like the main in- income stream. But real estate is starting to get up there. Um, have four properties now and uh, done one flip. So that was kind of like income stream for a bit. But uh, mainly just rentals and then trying out the Airbnb. And then also do uh, contracting renovations. Been doing that since grade well, I started out cutting lawns and stuff, you know, the usual story in grade four. Um, so that's kind of been one income stream, but that turned into contracting over the years. So I've been contracting, really ramped it up in the last uh, couple of years, but uh, mostly, mainly doing my own projects these days. But uh, but yeah, kind of contracting and then the real estate sales as well is going to be another income stream. And then uh, th- those are the main ones. So. And so how do you kind of balance all these different income streams? Do you focus on one at first and build it up? And then kind of once it's at a certain level, leave it there and move on to the next? Or what approach yeah. are you using? Yeah, it's uh, they're different areas, right? So you apply different strategies. Whereas when you work, you're kind of training time for money. So you could really only do so much of that. Like Gary Vee's kind of crazy. He'll go 18 <laughs> hours a day. But uh, for me, it's I kind of max out like doing renovations. I don't really want to do renovations for more than 30 hours a week. Working my day job is like 40 hours and then uh, handling real estate issues and stuff that comes up. It's, um, yeah, it's just kind of, uh, it is, it is the right thing at the right time. So when my time was a little bit more open, I did a lot more contracting renovations. I did some projects for you, for Jeff, Mm -hmm. um, kind of had more time available to do that. And then lately it's been working on my own projects. So I have to kind of turn down more jobs and uh, and kind of focus on that until that's set up. And and when you build up those areas like real estate, it's something it's not directly trained time for money. It's something that once you build it up, ideally, now you're not putting as much time into it, but you still have the income source. Your money's starting to work for you. Exactly. Your money's starting to work for you. So it's kind of the progression, the evolution of, um, of uh, I guess, how you make money and how you live. And you kind of got to start out working, training your time for money, unless you are you have an inheritance or something like that. But, uh, but yeah, kind of working and then transitioning more into like business and different things. So it's definitely the right, uh, right, right thing at the right time. And so how do you know when it's kind of the right time? Like, have you just been kind of transitioning in increments or kind of in chunks? 
Yeah. Like, how, how did you decide that, okay, I, I kind of need to scale back the contracting now, or I can only contract on my own projects? Right, right. Uh, I think it's intuition. Uh, it's also called a meta cognition or meta awareness, where you're aware of your thoughts. So if you can apply meta cognition to your day to day, where you're aware of kind of where the opportunities are, and uh, it's, it's basically three steps, you use assessment, um, evaluation. So in the beginning, you kind of look at where you want to go. And then while you're doing it, you assess it. And then in the future, you kind of look back and see how that impacted you. And when you do that and apply that to your life, you kind of see opportunities. Um, it becomes a lot clearer where you should be putting your time and your energy. So, so yeah, for me right now, the school board is like a big income source. So I've yeah. got quite a bit of in energy there. But in the next couple months, I see a huge opportunity in realtor sales and helping people build their portfolio and different things like that so especially it's spring approaching so now you'd maybe start like yeah, exactly. diverting some of your spring. focus to that yeah. Yeah. you've got like you know you you were doing contracting work for the people but now you see that you know you've got projects of your own to work on so you're going to divert your attention to that and start right. working on your own yeah so like you take that 80 20 rule and start applying 80 percent of your effort to, or yeah to to the the 20 percent mm -hmm. of things that are bringing you the, the most yeah. profit yeah so it's kind of, it's an ongoing evaluation, but it's really, you do get that feeling when you get excited about something or you see an opportunity or um, something comes up, you kind of get that feeling to jump into that, or at least I do. So Yeah, that's awesome. Um, So let's maybe just take a step back and take a look at your, let's go back to the roots. So financial independence, how did you originally kind of discover the idea? Was it a mm. book, a blog, a YouTube video? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, that, that's an evolution as well. Um, growing up. I, my parents were somewhat business minded. They had full time jobs, but pursued some other business opportunities. Um, so kind of saw them doing that. And then also uh, in Kincardin, which is a big Bruce Power town, mm -hmm. uh, they moved in right when Bruce Power closed down a couple plants. So the real estate was about half the value of uh, what it was a couple of years later. So it was in a real slump. And they bought a really nice property with a pool and everything for like you know, a hundred thousand or whatever. And, and now, and then seven years later we moved and it was at least double the value. And I think that's how I kind of saw the power of real estate and how you can leverage opportunities and, and that to kind of have some financial gain. But, um, that was kind of my big in, introduction into real estate. And then over time, uh, just through the network, seeing people getting into like, um, personal growth and different things, podcasts, uh, books, um, having that influence ongoing uh, has really um, kind of evolved my, my thinking about finance for freedom and where I should be putting my time and energy and different things. So. so do you mind maybe just painting a bit of a picture for our audience? What does your financial picture look like right now? You have a handful of rental properties? Yeah, yeah, I have a fairly small portfolio of about uh, four properties and um, yeah, my, the picture of it right now is I really like debt. I know some people aren't really comfortable with debt and whatever, mm -hmm. but I really like the leverage opportunity of it. And it's in something that is fairly secure real estate. Uh, and I only see the London area kind of going up. It's been the appreciation in London hasn't been too crazy for, for a while, but now it's kind of going up and people feel like that's kind of a bubble, but it's really, if you look at it, it's kind of just regular growth, but, uh, so right now it's just the properties uh, I, I purchase it for a decent price, but um, it doesn't have to be a crazy steal. Improve it a bit and rent it out. And um, not every property makes money like you guys know, but... Uh, and so ones... maybe just walk us through, when did you first get into real estate? Like what age and uh, what was that age is So I'm 28 now. I got in, I think, when I was about 22 or so. Uh, it was after I did my first initial two years at Fanshawe in construction engineering. And then went back and lived with my parents for about a year and a half and uh, saved up 25 grand, bought, bought a uh, townhouse on 3rd Street and then lived in that and went to school for another two years for electrical engineering. And then um, after that, I bought a property to flip, flip that property, turn that into a duplex and then turn that duplex. I was able to kind of um, turn it into another property, uh, the one on Sevilla, which is two, right. two properties. <laughs> yeah. So um so yeah, it's the it's the four four properties now, uh, and kind of looking ongoing to do some more flips. Um, looking to double my portfolio in the next couple of years to 
to at least two million, and then okay, yeah. So you have the two million over twenty years more amortized, uh, pay that down, right? And then in twenty years, it'll at least double in value. So you're saying on about four million, and if you have no no mortgages, you get about ten percent re- return. That'd be about uh, four hundred thousand dollars annually. So. When I'm 50, I'm hoping to have like at least that uh, that income, right? So. That's so awesome. Like that just shows the power of leverage because you know you don't have two million dollars right now, but you can mm-hmm. you own two million dollars in real estate. Yeah, and you can do that with. In in fact, you can do that with less than 20 percent, right? Like you've purchased properties with five percent down, and in the states, they can do as low as three and a half percent down. Yeah, yeah, it's massive leverage. And I know that at first, the idea, particularly for a lot of people that are personal finance oriented, the idea of getting a lot of leverage can be really scary. Right. But I think the key is to understand the reason we're attracted to real estate investing in the first place. It really comes down to leverage, right? The ability to use that leverage to our advantage. The idea of good debt versus bad debt. Yeah, if you can take $5,000 and buy a property for $100,000 and that $100,000 property goes up 4% per year, you're now making $4,000 in appreciation every year mm-hmm. on a $5,000 investment. So mm-hmm. your cash on cash return is way higher than you'd get without any other without with uh, without the leverage. Plus you're getting mortgage pay down, hopefully you're getting cash flow. You may not even rely on that appreciation at all. So it tends to be a, a, an investment that a lot of us are interested in, and it's mainly due to leverage. So Yeah, the leverage point is huge. Um, so yeah. when it comes to retiring for yourself, you know, we know you're big on lifestyle. Is it something that you'll ever want to do, retire? Or is like, what does financial independence look like for you? Uh, well, I'm pretty, like, I'm a high energy guy. I like to be doing lots of stuff. So the idea of retirement in the sense of slowing down and doing less isn't really appealing to me. But having more freedom and control is uh, over your life and your time and what you're what you're interested in that kind of thing is a, a huge, huge, very appealing to me. It's what's something you'd want to spend more time on if you had if you didn't have to worry about money as much or you weren't like in that phase where you're trying to build. What's something you want to spend your time on? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. That's something I've been thinking about lately, and uh, I think it would. It sounds kind of strange, but it kind of popped into my mind years ago, and it's uh, pursuing enlightenment. So it's kind of like Buddhism, Buddhism, yeah, meditation, uh, being in like a great state of of life and and all that, enjoying life. So yeah, if I had time, it's kind of, it's one of those things that it'd be a weird thing to pursue, but if you can pursue enlightenment, um, I can do that now. Like it doesn't take a lot of energy, money or whatever, but it just takes kind of time. And well, how do you reflect awareness. when you're working? You know, yeah. ninety hour weeks. Yeah, yeah. How do you find yeah, the time yeah, to reflect? Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I'm big on I'm big on nature, right? Like I love the idea of being able to go and do a through hike. I've mentioned before. Mm-hmm. Like that's like maybe the initial goal that you, a lot of people would see is like you want to hike, you know, thousands of kilometers. But really, the goal is to take that time to reflect on yourself, yeah. take a challenge, work on it, like. And yeah, I feel like, you know, getting into nature and just being by yourself or meeting other people, it's a great way to, you know, reach enlightenment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so like in your perspective, Paul, do you see it as, is there a certain goal marker or goal post you're going to hit and then you'll take the time to focus on enlightenment or are you tempted by the idea of things like mini retirements or mini vacations? Yeah, I think it is a bit of a goal post thing because just to set up financial independence for myself and being able to be generous for people around me in my life, family and friends and that kind of thing. I uh, definitely want to be in a position of, um, in a good financial position and that's definitely measurable. So, um, so like I was saying, kind of getting the portfolio up to about 2 million or so in my own and then, uh, and then scaling up some other, uh, my other income sources. And uh, at that point, I think I'd be able to step back from a full-time position and, it's really, it is very attainable to get your base income um, just through a couple income sources. Like if you have three or f- like at least a couple at 20 to 30,000, then you're kind of looking at your base, um, your base expenses covered. So, uh, so for me, it's, um, yeah, I don't want to say exactly because it's always a little bit um, like, you don't want to tell your employer you're going to be in that kind of thing. But I'm, I'm very happy where I am there. But uh, I could see in a couple of years reassessing stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. you, I like you talked about the idea of being generous. And I, I think we're hearing that more and more from people who are approaching that state of financial independence. Because, you know, a lot of us are, are a good way, a, a good portion of the way toward that state. And now we're starting to think, okay, like, 
how can I be more generous with my life? Like it's not mm-hmm. necessarily about sustaining my own lifestyle, but also maybe improving the lives of people around me. So mm-hmm. Matt Pichet, we've talked, uh, talk, actually we haven't talked about Matt Pichet. We'll have him on a future episode probably, <laughs> yeah. but he, uh, he's talked about the idea of, you know, making a, he had a, pa- a goal of $10,000 a month in passive income. And now he's talking about the idea of 20,000 a month in passive mm-hmm. income. And we see that part of the reason for that is he loves the idea of being able to grab his, you know, get, get a few of his friends together and pay for their flight down to meet him in Costa Rica. And, you know, they don't all expenses paid trip. They can, you know, he can just fly friends down anytime. And like, that's just yeah. one example of where you could be generous. And you could also, it's also kind of selfish at the same time, right? Cause yeah. how many people have that, the, that freedom in their life to be able to do something well, like that? And mm-hmm. I completely agree. Once you reach financial independence, once you're retired early, uh, you kind of look around and not necessarily everyone in your peer group is going to be at the exact same financial right. position. And so I think that that's things like myself, things that I know myself and Michael Rose have maybe struggled with, right? That all of a sudden we hit maybe that goal post or that marker and then we looked around and realized that everyone else was still doing their Crickets. nine to five. Yeah. And so, yeah, that idea of being able to be strategically generous or pay it forward in certain aspects, I find very enticing, very... Uh, yeah, I think yeah. that there's a lot of value in. Well, you that. said I remember a good like year and a half ago or something like that. You said secretly your goal is to just get more people to finish, so then yeah. you have people to hang out with. Because <laughs> what are these people doing at two p.m. on a Wednesday, right? Exactly. Everyone's, everyone's at work. That, that's the point of the YouTube, the point of the podcast, and the point of the meetups is to surround ourselves and create a community here, both locally and online, right? Related to financial independence. Yeah, and I do want to acknowledge your guys, uh, all of your energy and time you put into creating that community and inspiring people. It's been a big inspiration for myself and I know a lot of people around this area in Ontario like it's having an impact so so yeah I want to acknowledge you guys for that and that and means thank a lot. you yeah that time. does I mean at the, I think we're getting to a point where people it's it's almost self-sustaining like we can we can continue adding value and growing it but the people that are involved with it they're the people that are keeping it going at this stage mm. every person that shows up every person that shares a resource yeah, or lends right. a book yeah it, it's really awesome so maybe taking a step back uh I know you're really big on balance, Paul. So can you maybe talk to us about how you balance the different aspects, the your physical aspect, your mental aspect, your financial aspect? Um, right. I think you have a really interesting perspective and in kind of how you approach life, and we'd love to sure. dive deeper into it. Sure, yeah. So for that balance, um, I think scheduling is a big part of it. You find a lot of freedom just through having that schedule, and you're able to actually make time for stuff. So each day when I show up at work, I take my 15 minute break at 11 o'clock and I go outside and I stretch for 15 minutes or whatever. And uh, that gives me some good like cold exposure, which is good for your health, some good movement from getting up from the desk and whatever. And it's just automatic. So it's that balance that's just integrated into the day and I don't really have to think about it so much. Um, I like how you're taking advantage of the cold exposure that we get here in Canada. It's yeah. like, it's a, it's actually a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Some people would see that as a downside. Yeah, I, I get a lot of weird looks and uh, the one manager there. You, you, you wearing uh, clothes during this or what? Uh, just like a t-shirt, like what I'm wearing here. So yeah, You don't take uh, the tearaways? Or... <laughs> yeah, I just get, get my workout outfit on. But, uh, no, it's a pretty quick thing and people around work are used to it now. Like you get the weird looks and whatever, but and it, it's an excuse to start a conversation, so... It's okay. And, uh, and then just, uh, kind of digesting good information and, um, having a sense of urgency and implementing it into your life, um, where you hear something that maybe would work to help balance your life and uh, like a tactic or a tool or like a journal or whatever, and then just actually implementing it. So it reminds me of, you know, we talk about it for real estate all the time, but it applies to everything. If you want, if you want to learn about more, if you want to learn more about something or you want to expose yourself to more opportunities, talk to more people about these things, tell, make people aware mm-hmm. of what you're doing so that, that they'll, they'll start bringing resources to you or they'll start talking to you about what they're up to. Yeah. And I mean, you can do that with real estate and all of a sudden you'll get more private deals and you'll get more contacts and that kind of thing. But I mean, if you're out there stretching in the cold, like mm-hmm. you might get people approaching you that are part of that, you know, that, that are interested yeah, in that kind of sure, thing. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I see they share, they get, they're like, oh, well, I go for a walk every day in the morning or something like that, or yeah. kind of share their, their habit that they do. But, um, but yeah, and then, and then I think a big one is, um, like that you become like the people you're around. So Mm -hmm. I'm around some people who have very good balance and kind of, I'm able to analyze what they're doing and see what they're doing and then apply it to my own life. So 
I think yeah. it's like, it's also important to be open to share these things about your life, right? I know, mm-hmm. Matt, you've talked before about, you know, your, the value of social media and how, you know, mm-hmm. you know, a couple of years ago, you didn't even have a Facebook page and yeah. now, all, now your life is like <laughs> dedicated to social media in a lot of ways. Yeah. And there's got to be good reasons for that. Yeah. I, I find that really interesting though. So do you think if someone's looking to find more balance in their life, Paul, would you say just being aware of your habits and scheduling is that kind of one silver bullet you tell them to use yeah i'm kind of talking about the awareness point a lot but the awareness does play into that um and so like to kind of foster or generate that awareness like do you find like is tracking things important or what do you kind of do to make yourself more aware Hmm. like are you scheduling time to literally just kind of give yourself white space or blank space to right uh, explore what uh um yeah it's it's an interesting it's kind of like intuition and it's hard to um it's one of those things that it's hard to like quantify and break down yeah kind of having that balance yeah i think the awareness is really great and like an easy jump off point would be like yeah, getting into meditation a little bit more or just mm-hmm. scheduling a little bit of time to think about uh think about your own balance and where where you're kind of searching for it and uh where you kind of need it because like a balance for me came about because like I would burn out because I'd be yeah, going, just going hard too hard renovations working and it was kind of a result of taking on too much load where I realized okay like I have to have some balance here I have to like figure out my health and different things so how so, do you find meditation as something that is benefiting your finances or your business like how do you find that helping uh, just through when you're actually thinking about stuff and being aware of your thoughts, you see uh, see where opportunities come up and analyzing things a little bit more and, yeah. um, and that kind of thing. So it's, yeah, it's just one of those things. It's like a domino that once you're aware of your thoughts a little bit more, it since you're thinking about everything, it applies to all areas. So And um, so maybe just kind of jumping off the idea of meditation, I know Kellen's been playing around with Headspace, the yep, app, yep. and I've been playing around with Oak, which is an app on uh, the uh, iPhone operating system. And what, coming to Android at some point. I emailed the, oh, the did I emailed you? them awesome. and asked, and they said they will be coming up to Android at some point. <laughs> it, I really like it. It's free, so I recommend you guys check it out. But I'm curious, oh, nice. how do you approach meditating, Paul? Like, do you use an app? Do you just do it yourself? Uh, yeah, it's. I've tried the Headspace app, and that's a really good one. Um, it gives you that routine of getting into it, uh, listening to podcasts about the subject matter, like of meditation and awareness. Uh, for me, nature is a big, uh, big meditation, just going on like a walk. Um, yeah, just find those activities where you're kind of like in the flow as well. Uh, for, for me, construction, I get in the flow quite a bit when I'm building stuff. So can you talk more about that? The flow? Cause I know I've heard other friends talk about flow states. And yeah, that kind of yeah, like, yeah. How do you find those? Like, what, what do those mean to you? And like, how yeah. do they benefit your, your... The, the flow is you're, you're kind of just like in the moment and you're not really, um, yeah, your, your mind is essentially it's like your body releases all these chemicals that uh, in like you'd have to take like a crazy drug cocktail to synthesize, but you could only really do it through natural uh, processes. But to as like a ha- well, you can kick yourself into a flow through uh, it's like caffeine and then adrenaline and then I guess marijuana would do it as well. It's a, kind of like a synthetic flow. But if you can imagine what I'd be like, it's like you, you sprint, you take a bong toke, and then you oh my go, God. <laughs> um, yeah, and then, uh, and then you get and to then, business. And then take like a, an espresso, and that's like, that's a snowboarder's trick. Um, what, really? So that kind of kicks them into flow for snowboarding, but it's just like a mental, it's a, it's for, for me, it's like, yeah, if I have, if I'm getting into renovations, I'm just kind of in the moment, I'm going through it, like you lose your concept of time basically and uh you're just kind of enjoying what you're doing not not overanalyzing stuff so you're saying when i was like uh in a small little room painting it and i got high off paint (laughs) (laughs) on community (laughs) yeah Yeah. not quite but but maybe if you're really into the painting. no i I definitely uh, know that feeling though like and i'm joking about the painting but it's also true where like when i am painting a room like it's really easy to just kind of like it's kind of a menial task that like mm-hmm. keeps your body and your mind busy enough that you don't get cluttered with thoughts necessarily. Yeah, yeah, and and like so you can gain a little more perspective on it. I guess it's and another. It's weird. There's a flow trigger for if you're running with dogs. Uh, there's a weird thing that like um, if you're so this guy uh, 
uh, one of the big, I think it's, I forget who it is, but he's a big proponent of flow states and that, but he volunteers and he, he has a bunch of dogs that he um, just foster cares and then goes running through the mountains with them. Hmm. And they, they measured that the dogs and him are like kind of in flow state oh, together. Yeah. So the dogs sync up with him. And it's when you're doing something that's higher stakes, like if you misstep, you're, you can like break your ankle or that oh, kind okay. of thing. So, so skiers really get into it because you have to be really in the moment watching where you're going hmm. and there's that adrenaline kick. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of just like a higher stakes sort of, um, circumstance where like the consequences are real for oh, okay. like if, if you're like the construction, like if I misfire a nail into my hand, then that's, that's like, I have to be uber diligent that I'm not doing that. And I think that kind of triggers the flow as well. It's cool. But, uh, yeah. So changing gears a bit, we've talked uh, with Tom in the previous episode about traveling a lot. I think it's something we want to talk a bit more about on the podcast. Is there somewhere that interests you for travel that you like somewhere that you'd want to go? And, and if so, is there, is there a reason why that place interests you? Um, yeah, I, I'm really saving travel for down the road a little bit. And my girlfriend's really interested in traveling. And uh, we've kind of decided that we may do smaller trips around Canada or Florida or that kind of thing. Uh, until we're able to do like a larger trip Um, but definitely Europe experiencing different cultures uh, you learn a lot when you travel into different cultures Um, recently I've I've started noticing that like the distance you're going I mean like uh, the distance that you're going doesn't really make a big difference in terms of cost sometimes you can go to Iceland for cheaper than you can go to Vancouver from here so like you know staying within Canada isn't necessarily going to be less expensive or anything Mm -hmm. like that I mean it really comes down to time, right? Like if you're yeah. going to go to Europe and you're going to really want to travel around, you're probably going to want more time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, when the time is a little bit more abundant than, uh, time and finances are more abundant, then I think it's a great time to make those big trips and that. But, uh, in the meantime, I really love London. I really love traveling down to the market and I go, uh, get some like fresh, fresh greens and fresh, uh, fresh food, fresh eggs, all that. And then I'll, I'll travel to the gym and there I'll go for a bike in Florida because they have those biking simulations. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> they yeah. have those screens at Good Life. So I pick pick Florida or whatever. <laughs> yeah, like watching Anthony Bourdain, the layover, I travel through his experiences and that kind of thing. Like it's a little bit lame because I'm not totally jumping on it, but I truly believe in the right thing at the right time. And I'm very, very inspired to grow real estate and uh, other income sources and invest in the area versus um, looking to do that elsewhere so it's it's something I'm really excited for in life but not at this time so cool and so another thing that we wanted to talk to you about is I know you're a big kind of life hacker or body hacker or you're constantly doing different experiments right yeah. um, are you currently experimenting with anything that you'd want to discuss or chat um, about or yeah in the last little while got a uh, well, I've really been kind of hacking my work set up at the desk because yeah. I kind of worked for a couple of years at the desk and you start to realize how that uh, wears on your body. Mm-hmm. You start to realize you have a little more pain or whatever. You just feel stiff at the end of the day. So, uh, yeah, I've been doing a couple of things to hack that. Like, um, I got a stand-up desk through work. They supplied that. So oh, nice. you can maybe talk to your employer about getting a nice stand-up desk. It's limited to kind of a dual screen setup, but... Uh, if you have more screens than that, you kind of have to get a bit fancy, but you can just get a platform that goes up and down and sits on your, your desk. So do you stand all day or do you sit and stand? And uh, I, I, I change between the two. So I'll yeah. do, uh, yeah, I'll do some standing, some sitting. It's more about moving and not being in the same yes. posture throughout the day. So my understanding uh, is neither one is good to do all day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They both have their issues, but when you can switch around and yeah. move, it's, it's better than just being in one posture all day. And, uh, and then, I've upgraded my earphones because I listen to podcasts throughout the day. So upgrading my earphones to, they're called air tubes. They're on Amazon for maybe 30 bucks and, uh, they isolate the speakers so that there's no EMFs, which are electromagnetic, uh, fields being drilled right into your, your head, right into your brain, which may cause some issues from some research I've seen, but, um, that's one thing. So you're kind of, yeah, I, I was noticing he's getting maybe little headaches and stuff throughout the day, and that kind of took care of that. Oh, that's cool. Um, and then I ha- got uh, it's anti glare kind of blue blocker uh, glasses. So they made some lately now that aren't tinted amber, so they don't look so weird. So you can find those on Amazon, <laughs> just uh, anti glare blue blocking glasses. You wear those and, at the desk um, during the during the day. Yeah, I wear yeah. those at the desk because you're staring at a monitor all day, and 
staring into like that light and stuff yeah. fatigues your eyes and uh so that's definitely helped quite a bit and um that's yeah cool. that's kind of some of the experiments cool yeah yeah no yeah that's that's awesome i always like hearing kind of what you're up to so cool so what do your friends and family think about how you're approaching your life and finances right now um i think uh mostly it's like positive they uh they they kind of that no one is really uh bringing negativity towards my ambitions i'm able to talk about it openly with people uh my brother is also investing in real estate so he's um we're kind of on the same page able to share our our um successes and issues and whatever so so that's really nice and uh it's good and the balance of yeah. like like the work-life balance thing right like if mm-hmm. you're doing 90 hour weeks is that is that is that a challenge on anybody in right. life or is that like is that yeah. something that you're working your way around yeah it's definitely a challenge in relationships because um you want to put lots of time into your relationships time and whatever and uh and so my girlfriend and i we've it's kind of been a bit of a journey to get onto the same page where it's like yeah, we're gonna, now it's kind of crazy. There isn't a whole lot of time. Like we do make time for each other, but we also have to be able to support each other when um, we're either of us is out putting a lot of energy. So it's kind of finding that agreement to where you're able to work with each other and kind of be on the same page without butting heads and bringing each other down maybe. It's so, a big challenge, honestly. Yeah. 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 So any tips or tricks to uh, how to create those relationships or how it to takes, foster that? It takes a couple, like it does take, like there will be conflicts, right? So it yeah. takes a couple of those, but just talking throughout it is a huge thing. Uh, you have to be able to talk about what you're feeling, where you want to go and kind of get on the same page. And um, yeah, you have to be able to do that if you want to make it a long-term relationship. Because absolutely, otherwise there's going to be issues throughout the way, uh, throughout the uh, throughout the time, and you know, nobody really wants to be in that space. Like it's not good for yourself or for your partner. So yeah, it's just communication. Identify your goals. Like you know, make sure you're both zooming out and seeing the big picture of why you're doing this. It's mm-hmm. not just the day to day. I'm just working. I, I got to work. Like yeah. well, you know, what's the, why? Like what are the goals here? Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I think one thing that I've really realized with you Paul is that you're very big on positivity and gratitude and just kind of embracing all that and so me and Kellen were talking and kind of wanted to dive more into that so do you want to kind of talk to us about the importance of positivity in your perspective and uh after that we'll maybe dive into I think one of your most famous questions that you ask everyone oh cool yeah yeah I was just about to ask it but uh (laughs) to uh postpone it a little bit um yeah, that was one of the things, uh, Lewis Howe's School of Greatness podcast, uh, he, it was something he was a big pro- proponent of, and he's kind of pushing that, uh, yeah, just being grateful for things. And I've been watching him. He's really and, good. Uh, and yeah, and it's like a great space to be in, a space of gratitude, and it impacts everything in life, um, because when you're focusing on kind of the goodness in life, or where, what you're happy about, or, or you're it's kind of like you're focusing on uh, growth instead of like what's going wrong. And mm-hmm. so since you're focusing on that growth or that gratitude, now everything else in life kind of falls in line with that. It's another one of those domino domino things that impact different areas. So yeah, it's like, it's a pretty easy practice, but just being grateful for something like I've heard of people having a practice of having like a gratitude song for me, it's Kanye West, Good Morning, and uh, <laughs> nice. just... Uh, and so what does that mean to you, really, play. a gratitude song? Yeah, it's just a song that you put it on, and then you start, uh, you ask yourself that question, like, what are you grateful for? Oh, okay. And it just kind of plays while you're doing that little practice. And um, yeah, so when you're doing that, asking yourself kind of like specific uh, questions, looking for the specific areas, something that you can tie in your mind to like an experience or something mm-hmm. like that. So uh, it reminds me of people who have the, uh, I, I think a few of you guys have alarm clock in the morning. You get, wake up to Gary <laughs> V screaming at you and telling you to get to work. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, uh, Just start your day in the right. Yeah. <laughs> and so talking more about kind of gratitude and looking for the things to be grateful in just for our audience, can you kind of talk us through? So are you finding something to be grateful for in every situation or something to be grateful for every day? So like, for mm-hmm. example, let's say, um, I just evicted a tenant and they've trashed the unit. Mm. Do you, oh, you look, should be grateful. Do you look, no, well, I'm asking though seriously, like, should you be looking at it as like, well, I'm grateful that this 
negative influences out of my life? Or are you more looking for the gratefulness and something else? Like, well, today I found $10 on the ground. Like, right. I'm just curious how you're kind of approaching it. Yeah. Well, you kind of answered the question. It's, it'd be both sides of that. So I was just having that same chat with my brother the other day. Uh, I was like, yeah, well, when that does happen, I'm really grateful that those people are out of the property mm-hmm. and you won't be dealing with them, uh, any longer. So, so yeah, you have that gratitude piece of it. For me, it's more of just, uh, like I really got into it through is just writing in a journal each day, three things I'm grateful for. And then, and then kind of asking a lot of people that, that question, what are you grateful for? And then seeing their answers and kind of applying it to my life. Um, so it kind of becomes, it kind of become, it kind of changes your, your thought process. Um, and by you being aware, like I could tell that you're already kind of aware of it by being grateful for them being out of the property. Now you're focusing on kind of growth in the future and the future of that property versus if you're focused on how that tenant screwed you over yeah. and how you lost money and, and that kind of thing your outlook on business and real estate is now going to be at a place of um, kind of negativity instead of growth. I think that's so so important because the more you get into side hustles and multiple streams of income, the more you start seeing all the opportunities around you. Mm -hmm. And if you're focusing on all the lost opportunities instead of focusing on all the potential new opportunities. Yeah, it's hard to grow. Yeah. So I guess the hard-hitting question, what what are you grateful for? <laughs> well, I kind of acknowledged you guys earlier, but I'm grateful for uh, the London community and, and you guys especially, the fire community, and uh, just that there's people in the area that are like uh, very aware and kind of on the path to growth and uh, that it's not a, a, a thing of scarcity to have good people and good network around and, and that kind of thing. So most of all, I'm grateful for that lately. And, uh, and then, yeah, I'm grateful for, um, kind of like opportunities in life and the, the things that are going on in life and, uh, get to be pretty excited about stuff and, and, and I'm grateful for the grind most of all, I think, uh, <laughs> grateful for the grind, I'm grateful for the grind. Cause yeah, I love it. Like, like you're saying, like that tenant kind of moved out and, um, and maybe screwed you over a bit, but how much did you learn about uh, the human condition and about mm-hmm. about people and uh, and that kind of thing? Like I've learned a lot about people through owning property and renting. Yeah, their own. oh my god! Actually, I think that that's actually yeah. a huge point. The amount of life lessons and uh, different perspectives I've been exposed to as being a landlord. Mm-hmm. Um, frequently, some of my tenants are in the lower income spectrum of society, and like to understand that oftentimes. Some of their actions that may seem illogical to me maybe seem rational to them based on the mm-hmm. information they're using in their past experiences. So, but I just kind of want to touch upon. I think that the key to gratitude is, and you kind of got to it there, Paul, was the looking forward. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, even if you're being grateful for something that happened in the past, that's kind of static and out of your control. Where the future, at least, we all kind of have. A, a degree of control, a locus of control over. And I think that's really powerful for giving us a sense of accomplishment, ability to be grateful. I just kind of wanted to highlight that. Yeah, good good summary and good point. Uh, how about you, Matt? What are you grateful for today? Uh, I've been grateful for a lot of things. Recently, my real estate business has been operating more smoothly. I've started really mm. focusing on building a, a better team around me. Um, for the longest time, I think I was focused on short-term wins and short-term successes rather than kind of what what my plan was going to be whether it was three weeks three months or three years from now and so just actually taking the time to plan things out I'm really grateful that (laughs) I've been finally took a beat gave myself the time to think things through and plan out and then now I kind of have the springboard to actually execute on so that's something I'm really grateful for otherwise I'm grateful hit 6,000 subscribers this week on YouTube. So that was amazing. So I'm grateful for everyone listening to this podcast that's ever smashed that subscribe button because it really does mean a lot to me. And so I'll pass the torch off of gratitude to (laughs) Helen. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things I'm most grateful for right now is I've been able to take some time this winter, I think, to kind of scale back, take take a like zoom out a bit start looking at like my own personal to-do list and get my own life in order because I've been focusing so much of my time on, you know, my rental properties and my business and my work, but I need to start looking over, looking after myself a little bit. So Mm -hmm. 
you know that never ending to do list i've kind of gotten most of the way through it which you no one ever does but i feel like i actually i've kind of i've gotten to that point and i've literally zeroed my inbox on my gmail yeah. and like i'm feeling like i've i've got a fresh start like tabula rasa and i'm ready to kind of to the use talk about a springboard right like Literally, it's going to be spring soon. I think summer's coming, and now I can kind of, I'll have the energy, I'll have the momentum to really dive into new opportunities. And I kind of, I feel like I've gotten my life a lot more in order quite recently. I'm really grateful for that. So, Paul, we kind of talked about it already, but so $2 million is kind of the goal for your real estate portfolio. Is that the primary pillar for your financial independence number? And then, does that $2 million, does that represent a certain passive income number to you? Or is it really just the asset base that's important? Yeah, the asset base long term, uh, been looking at different, different things and how they play in and like assessing the pension is it, it's hard to wrap your head around but uh, so I'm 28. And if I retired at 55, um, that'd be you know, another 20 something years of working mm -hmm. and uh, the payback for it. I'm really interested in longevity. So if I could live for till I'm 100 and live for 45 years after retirement, receive a pension of 50,000 a year, it equals to about two, two and a half million. Uh, what the pension pay it would be like, is that worth working again for working until mm -hmm. the end of, the, of that? So that's kind of a, something I've been playing with and, and assessing, but I think ultimately it will come down to kind of early retirement and building up real estate. Uh, as long as I'm kind of above the 100K a year mark, I'm pretty happy. Uh, so that'd be through like renovations, real estate agent stuff. Um, and so that $100,000 a year, how did you come upon that idea? I uh, just look at my spending habits and then um, kind of having a bit of an excess beyond that. Uh, I have good energy, I'm young, I like working. So, um, it's kind of just, uh, kind of like a minimum, it's a little bit, uh, random arbitrary. I didn't like crunch the numbers a lot on it, but I just know at a minimum, that's kind of where I want to be. I think there's so many people that they set goals like that for themselves. And a lot of people end up retiring a lot later than they really need to, because mm -hmm. especially people like yourself who are, you're planning on working in your, in your financial independence, in your retirement, yeah. quote unquote. Um, so how much money do you really need? How much passive income do you really need if, you're, if your goal is to continue working anyway? And there's mm -hmm. a lot of people that, that work a lot longer than they really need to uh, just because they're unaware of how much, how much they really need, right? Yeah. And that's where reverse engineering is such a powerful, powerful thing. I've done very little of it myself. Um, I know Matt's a big proponent of it. Just like identify your goal. One thing that I've struggled with alone is identifying that goal. And then once you've identified it, reverse engineer it, what are the steps, and then take daily action to, to, toward mm -hmm. that goal. Um, but it all starts by identifying that goal in the first place. Yeah, yeah. identify the areas where you can make money or you can, you're kind of in that working in areas that you want to be working in. And for me, it's a big, big thing about uh, what I'm doing is the relation, relationship part of it. I have some great relationships through my day job, but when I look at the relationships that really last and turn into friendships, it's more through contracting, through real estate agent, um, that kind of thing. So yeah, I kind of uh, want to move into that area a bit more and, um, and, and yeah, it's, it's a lot closer than I thought it would be, um, just through like, I'm getting into almost seven years in real estate and it hasn't been like I haven't grown a lot, but it's just been continuous over time and sneaks up on you. Incremental yeah, growth. Incremental and it's starting to add up to something that's uh, significant. So I yeah. think a lot of us get surprised. It seems like even those of us that really track things on a spreadsheet or we've done our calculations, our safe withdrawal rates, we still, there seems to just be kind of a day you wake up and you realize like, Oh wow, mm. I, I'm going to be okay no matter what happens. Yeah. And a lot of that, doesn't even come down to a really specific financial number. It comes down to the habits and skill sets we've acquired over our journey towards financial independence. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. And then I'll add on to that. Um, like a lot of my interests are something that it's really, it takes a lot of money to fuel, like traveling would be one, but mostly I love just uh, like hitting the gym, having a nice workout, going for walks, spending time with people, um, that kind of thing. So like my number isn't uh, how much isn't does that crazy. cost, right? Yeah, how yeah. much is that? Mm -hmm. How much so, does it cost uh, to pick things up and put them down and talk <laughs> yeah, to people, right? Yeah, but it depends all what you're motivated by. Like, I do kind of like nice things, but they don't really 
do it for me. I don't see the value I'm measuring up to the cost of like a Rolex or a really it's like expensive car. Short term yeah. happiness, right? Yeah. Acute yeah. happiness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. yeah. Let's uh, dive into the fire four then. So our first question, Paul, is just spreadsheet junkies. So do you track your net worth? Do you track your spending? Kind of what numbers do you track and how do you track them? Um, so tracking, uh, ever since like a young age has been, I've always had that mental, uh, ongoing tally. So I kind of keep a lot of things up in my head and know where I'm at kind of overall, uh, just in, in, in my head, uh, which may not work as you scale up and kind of get larger. But I think overall, like Grant Cardone, he probably still has a, a running tally in his head of what's a going ballpark. on. Yeah, yeah, ballpark. And so. then so do you approach your expenses the same way? Like do you track your expenses carefully or do you just uh-huh. kind of have a ballpark understanding of? Yeah, yeah, I've done a little bit of tracking experiments and um, like to kind of each year assess how much did I make, how much did I spend about. Mm-hmm. And I kind of get a feeling when I do that, uh, either annually or with my running total, if um, something... If I've been spending too much, I just, it kind of is awareness that uh, it's like, okay, I shouldn't be spending so much money on just random Amazon orders or, um, or this, this or that. But, but two day shipping. <laughs> yeah, oh, two I, day It's shipping. really bad. I click and it's there. Amazon yeah. is really bad yeah. for me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so I, I don't have specific spreadsheets for tracking net worth, but I love, uh. I love Google Docs, the cloud storage. I think that's just such a such an amazing tool. Mm-hmm. I use that for renovations, just for keeping people on the same page and keeping track of what gets done, how much time is in it. Put the scope of work in there so that contractors can upload their time and expenses and that kind of thing. And it's just an ongoing tally of what the project is at. Uh, I really like that for renovations, but um, for the budgeting, it's not really my style. I'm I'm more of like an action person. So if there's, I'd rather be kind of taking action versus tracking my mm-hmm. uh, my budget. So that's yeah. cool. So what about guilty pleasures? Is there anything that you like to indulge in occasionally? Uh well, I do like food. So I'm big on like local food and uh, buying quality quality um, food and that kind of thing. So spend probably a little bit more more money on it but really when you're away from processed food and you're just buying like eggs I get a flat of eggs for like 1050 which is like I think three dozen of um, local eggs from the Western Fair Market uh, there's really good bacon there for like six dollars for a pack so it's not that much more than the grocery store and uh, and that kind of thing so it's it's one of those things that yeah I'll spend a bit more on food um, I do spend quite a bit on like those life hacks. If I hear about something on a podcast, I'll like go order it on Amazon. I think Spotify is one of like a guilty pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I bought kind it. Kind of too. ongoing expense. But you get a family just, together uh, and it's not so expensive. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm paying three bucks a month right now to, to share in a family for Spotify oh, really? premium. So yeah. That's a good deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I should do that. Pro tip. Yeah. yeah. Get five friends together. Um, so another question we have for you. Is there a tool that you couldn't live without or a tool that adds a lot of value to your life? One thing that comes to mind is a French press, just like a really nice French press each morning, making that awesome cup of coffee. Uh, You're the second guest to use French press. Is it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe we'll say something. <laughs> no, else. Tom, Tom was using French press when he was <laughs> yeah. traveling the world. That oh, was actually okay. something carried yeah. to them everywhere. Yeah. Um, <laughs> here, I'll rethink that. <laughs> <laughs> so is there a frugality tip or a life hack that you'd want to share with the listeners? Uh, lately, I think frugality is coming to um, buying bulk. So getting like, I get a really nice coffee off Amazon for $30 a kilogram. And that lasts me for a, a long time versus buying individual pounds for uh, whatever it is, $20 or something. So just having those opportunities to buy bulk, Costco, hit up your your Costco for those things that you use regularly and uh and only buy things in bulk that you know you're going to use right yeah, yeah. i've had way too many times where i bought in bulk and then throw out half of it yeah, yeah i think that's like yeah yeah that's a little hanging fruit i think there but um i think investing in yourself you can't afford not to invest in yourself and it doesn't necessarily take a lot of money um i've done a lot of kind of personal growth just through podcast a book you can uh, download books or if you buy them they're like 10 15 dollars uh, that kind of thing doesn't cost a lot of money, but um, when you invest in yourself, you you gain in a lot of other ways. So yeah, I think that that instills the frugality of yeah. If you can invest in low cost frugality tips like this podcast or whatever, 
then uh, it would help instill that frugality. Great. Awesome. And so just before we wrap things up, Paul, we'd like to always have our uh, guests ask our audience a question. So I know that kind of before we started the show, you were talking about you might be looking for an apprentice in the future. Um, yeah. So, yeah, was there a question you wanted to ask our audience? Or? Uh, uh, mainly, I want to ask what people are grateful for, see what uh, what's going on in people's heads and in their lives. Uh, that's always really interesting to me. Um, but, yeah, and then also... If there's anybody who's looking to learn more about renovations and has a couple of years experience and looking to grow in real estate and that kind of thing, uh, sees what I'm doing and maybe is interested in that sort of path, uh, if they want to shoot me a, a DM, then um, yeah, I'm looking for people to, to work with and grow the team and that kind of thing. So Even if you're not in London, move down here, join London on Fire, <laughs> meet all of us. and uh, We're creating the fire <laughs> mecca of North America. <laughs> London, Ontario. We're doing our best. And so otherwise, we'd also love to hear from you guys. Are you currently looking to build your team? And how do you go about building your team, particularly if you're building your team, say, from just you to team member number two? I think that that's mm-hmm. probably the hardest thing to scale is bringing on that first team member. So we'd love to hear about it on the uh, London on Fire Facebook group. So just jump over to our Facebook page and uh, yeah, let us know. So thanks again for joining us, Paul. Really appreciate you uh, coming on the show. Yeah, absolute pleasure and uh, really enjoyed the experience and hope you guys can keep putting out the good information and growing this movement. Awesome. Thank you. That was great. I really want to hear what you, the audience, are grateful for. So jump over to the London on Fire Facebook group and leave a comment on what you're currently grateful for. I need reminders about things like this, having multiple income streams. It's so important to have at least a trickle of money coming from a few different sources. Even if one stream gets blocked up, there's always money coming in from other projects. And so talking about money, we're thinking about hiring an editor. Anyone got any experience? Anyone you'd recommend from Fiverr? Slide into our DMs on Insta at On Fire Podcast. And make sure to tune into our next On Fire Podcast to meet more people, hear their stories, and learn from their mistakes. Thanks for listening. This is Matt and Kellen signing off. And until next episode, remember, fuck being normal, buying stuff doesn't make you happy, and always remember what Teddy Roosevelt said. Comparison is the thief of joy.